it's a great evening here on the Listen My Son channel. And tonight we're going to be having a nice conversation with Jerry Trueheart, one of our favorite guests. Let me just fire up a pipe first, then I'll bring him on. And we're going to talk about how to be a good writer. Jared knows a little bit about writing. He used to be a writer for Return of Kings, which was a phenomenal piece for men. He was a contributor for that. And you've heard him many times here as he's written about America's deadly sins and things that we can do to help ourselves in this country that is guilty of gluttony and greed and so forth. But we're going to be talking about how to be a good writer. And there's not a lot of people that are qualified to speak about that. And Jared is one of those people. So let me bring him on. Anyways, good evening to everybody. Uh, Thea, Jimmy, Lucas, Lover, Ghostblade, Peg Bell, Joseph Ward, Josh, Elderman. It's good to have you all here. And uh, take some notes. Jared is always a channel favorite. Always has something good to share. Let me turn off this heater. Hold on one second. So we're not getting any background noise. Oh, there we go. Nice and quiet. And here is Jared Trueheart. How are you, sir? Good to see you. Hello. Can you hear me well? I can. Audio is good. I'm a, I decided to join you. I'm going to try and light mine up as well. Excellent. So, for those who haven't been following George the last few days, he has uh, been putting stuff out on Twitter and his email about somebody's know some you know something that somebody's going to pay you for. That yes. All you have to do is find a way. And I'm a uh, one. Th I've heard this message from him for a long time, and the part that I struggle with is that. I'm uh, confident, or not confident, competent, am confident, but competent in all my work and everything I do for a living. But when it comes time to put pen to paper and to say, what do I do that I can sell to people? Being competent, yes. you know, it, it's, it does, it's not specific enough. It's too ambiguous, you know? Right. So I've been thinking about it and... Right. One of the things I do really well. Well, I'll tell you, I of anyone better to uh, to share this issue with than you. You are uh, after we did our series on the America's. Uh, you you definitely qualified yourself uh, in a way that is very unique and that endeared yourself to my audience. Yes, when when we wrote that was on the deadly sins, and we talked about them. And those were all great discussions. And if you're if anybody's watching this and they're able to, they haven't seen it, you need to go back in the catalog and and watch them. Those are great discussions. <laughs> Absolutely. So and tonight the, George, we're uh, writing on Patreon too. Yes, yes, they are on Patreon. Those those essays are on Patreon and are. Uh, Definitely appreciated, no doubt. And I've, I've thought about them. When somebody writes something and you still think about it long after you read it, you know it's valuable work. And I think about your work and it uh, convicts me. Your writing convicts me. It makes me think about my life. And when you were talking about uh, some of the I guess, for lack of a better term, America's deadliest sins or our vices. It, it, uh, you know, there there were some things that really spoke to me there, honestly, and uh, and still work in my heart to this day. Well, thank so, you for that. For me as well, things I didn't notice 
uh, about myself until I really started uh, putting, you know, pen to paper, so to speak. And, mm -hmm. you know, whenever you write, you tend to draw from your life in, in some way. And especially if you're not writing very dry, technical uh, instructions you tend right. to, some of some of your own personality and personal history almost always comes through. Yep, you're right about that. You are right about that. Well, tonight's topic is uh, how to be good at writing or how to start writing. And uh, tell me about your history, your personal history. How did you get start get started in writing? <clears throat> were you, were you always good? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't quite know it at the time, though. I mm -hmm. once we had a scary story writing contest in maybe fourth or fifth grade. And somehow I think my mom saved it and I've got it around here somewhere. And it was the I'm not making this is what I really wrote at nine or ten years old. It was the attack of the deadly kangaroos. And <laughs> It was a scary story contest for Halloween, and I won it, which I oh, did that's not great. expect. And then, so that was the earliest uh, ac uh, accolades I got for writing. But in college, much more so than high school, uh, I did. I always got really good grades on my research essays, and anytime I had to write two or three or page two or three pages or more i always got really good grades on those and there was a period after i graduated with a four-year degree where i was moving throughout the country and i remember one time i didn't have a job i was living in oakland and i was like you know what i did write pretty good research essays i'm just gonna do one just because i was like bumming around and couldn't find work. Oakland, this was right after the Great Recession. So we're talking circa 2009, 2010. Yeah. And I just remember writing a 10 page research essay on uh, the topic was if we mandated paternity testing at birth, it would reduce domestic violence. Yeah. And that was a very interesting and enlightening one for me because I remember thinking, this is about you know, a solid way we could reduce, you know, male on female domestic partner violence. And I remember telling it to all kinds of women at the bar and George, they hated it. They hated the <laughs> idea of it. <laughs> they hated the idea of, you know, knowing beyond a reasonable doubt whose baby that is, you know. The guys loved it <laughs> so that was, so that was my so uh, that was very enlightening for me and then i went back to college and i did more writing and just really good at it and i started writing for return of kings oh no oh no uh, let me go back just a little bit go take you to 2014 2015 i started thinking about you know all the attacks on masculinity, everybody trying to redefine it, not many people having a very good grasp on it. And I thought, if I died, how would my sons learn what masculinity is? So I wrote my first book on it. Called, uh, let me see if I can grab it real quick, right behind me. Mm -hmm. It was this one, Making Manhood in Modern America. I wrote that. For that purpose and after that i just had so many ideas still and i was writing research essays always really really high quality so i started a blog called legends of men it was about masculinity in literature and culture and what it really means and things things of that nature and, and, that, and that's one of, that's one of the ways that i found you was through that on mm -hmm. twitter many years ago that's right. And That's right. Uh, and uh, magnificent writing. Magnificent. It was just 
a couple levels above all of the emotional stuff and the reactionary stuff. It was good. Thank you. And that is what I tried to do when I tried to, you know, stick to like roughly a thousand words. So this would be like three full page papers, uh, you know, if it was typed and double spaced and yes. I tried to do, do more long form like that. And I'll tell you what, writing a few hundred of those and writing three pages just becomes easy, you know. And I also wrote for Return of Kings in 2017. Um, for those who don't know what Return of Kings, it was it was one of the more popular Red Pill Manosphere websites. Um, it was hosted by Rush V, but he was more of an editor, and various people could submit their essays to their, you know, hundreds of thousands of people would read it. So it was a good. Uh, oh, and I got a lot of a uh, lot of praise there too. A lot of. Uh, my articles were promoted quite a bit there. So, yeah, I was happy with that. Um, now, does that still exist? Return of Kings? I believe only as historical documents. Like, it's not updated. Mm -hmm. um, it's not even search results, really. You have to go directly there. I don't think Roosh V bothered to take it down just because it had so many hundreds of people's articles. But I. So when I was doing Legends of Men, I was also working at a university and some of the college students searched me and my name and they didn't like what they read. So they tried to have me fired. I didn't get fired, thankfully. But uh, I asked Roosh to take down all the articles I had put up there because I put my most controversial articles behind a paywall. And that's that's yeah. how I got around that. And yeah, that, that worked. So he was he was kind enough to do that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, after that, it was it's just been a uh, reading and writing, and um, that's one of the most important things about. If there's two important things I could say about being a good writer, it's first of all you have to read a lot, and second of all you have to practice. You have to practice. Information in, information out. When it comes in, it kind of combines synergistically with other things that are stored in there, and who knows what will come out when you write. Do you do you subscribe to the mind dump uh, methodology? Do you just like write like crazy and then edit like crazy after that? No, in fact, I'm uh, completely opposed to that idea in terms of okay. my own writing. And if it works for some, if it works for you uh, out there, great. <laughs> I think uh, good writing, good re meaning, uh, and I sent George some tools. He'll, uh, he'll, he'll release them when he gets a chance. But, uh, you know, for me, I define writing that's really well as... Let me see. I'm going to one of those tools I sent sent him. It has to be clear, concise, efficient, and well structured. So you create an outline, and then you kind of you create a skeleton, and then you kind of fill it in. You know, mm -hmm. you kind of uh, create the template for yourself. That's right, and mm -hmm. and depending on what you're writing. For example, if it's in, if it's nonfiction, most nonfiction, or if it's an essay, an argument, uh, explanation, persuasive, anything like that, it they all generally follow the same structure, which is you know you've got your thesis, and your supporting arguments and your conclusion, and then uh, no matter how long it is, if it's a book, same thing: thesis, supporting arguments, conclusion. And mm -hmm. you scale it all the way down. So that one, so a book will have an introductory chapter with the thesis, supporting argument chapters all the way to the conclusion. Each chapter will have its own thesis, which is then supported by uh, subsections, which are arguments, and then a conclusion. 
And even each paragraph will have a thesis with supporting sentences and a conclusion. And you can, you can go all the way down like that. And if you follow that, the, it's, if you follow that, there's no way somebody can misinterpret your point, which is the most important part. And it also keeps you as a writer uh, on track because oftentimes what happens is you start writing, you start getting in a flow, thoughts pop in your head. And then when you go to edit, you realize, you know, this doesn't really have much to do with the point I'm trying to make here. And you end up having to, to delete it. So but as long as, when you structure it that way, it helps you to think in a way that is communicating to the audience so that they will understand what you're trying to say. You said something that is uh, dear to my heart when you said something like you're when you're in the flow or in the zone, some people would say, and then you can just fly through the paragraphs, the yeah. chapters at that point. Before you know it, there's 10 pages that are done. Yes, this, and especially depending on what you're writing. If you ever have to include like data or something like that or cite other references or things like you know you want to, you got to have a place to put it. You got to have an idea where you want to put it. So that's when you the structure really helps. When you're able to do something more like um, make an argument based on your past experiences, or you know, if you're able to tell a little more of a story, um, you know, maybe biographical story or just a story of somewhere else, but someone else, but that proves the point you're trying to make. You can flow with it a little more, and you can embellish it a little more as you see fit you know, take things, uh, add things in, take them away, you know, more as you, more as you like. Whereas when you're trying to really structure a persuasion, persuasive or explanatory or anything that recalls data or just, you know, or outside reference, you really want to keep that structure in there. And it, it helps you as a writer to include what you want to include as m much as anything else. Now, do you write to at an intellectual level or an emotional level? It, it, it's been said that people purchase, people buy things emotionally, and then they justify the purchase, mm -hmm. you know, intellectually. So E over I. Yeah. So emotions, then intellect. How do you write? Do you write? from your head or do you write from your heart? I think for me, it's more of the opposite. I think I have that intellectual observation. And I off, usually if I'm writing something, it's because I feel like nobody else is observing it, or at least not in the way that I am. They can't explain it as well as I can. So I, I take that intellectual step first and then Without emotion, though, without the kind of the raw human purpose of what you're writing, it becomes very stale. So for me, finding the that why and that purpose uh, comes later. One of the one of my favorite things that I wrote when I was doing Legends of Men was I wrote this uh, terrific essay. If I don't say do say so myself, it was why on on why you need to forgive your father, essentially. And it's because we all pay for the sins of our father one way or another, especially if we don't forgive them. And my uh, two examples, three examples, you could kind of say, but my favorite example from that is Lane Staley. And I'm sure you know that name as the lead singer of Alice in Chains. Alice in Chains, of course. Yeah, he's one of my absolute favorites. And I always think of how tragic it is, how he died. Uh, he, he, once he became famous, his dad came back into his life and they started doing heroin together. And he just wanted to connect with his dad. His dad really was a heroin addict and really just wanted access to money and heroin. 
well, what an unfortunate thing that his dad kicked the habit and Lane Staley died of it. Interesting. Yeah. And I, I think about that sometimes, especially when I think about him, because he really paid for the sins of his father. You know, he couldn't, he couldn't overcome what his father did to him. And I think he never forgave his father for abandoning him. And if he could have, I think he could have taken that, that first most important step to stop being heroin once and for all. You know, it's funny that you mentioned Lane Staley. Uh, Alice in Chains, the Unplugged album, is really one of my top ten favorite albums of all time. I didn't. I really loved the whole MTV Unplugged series, mm -hmm. but I will tell you the Alice in Chains broadcast. That album, Alice in Chains Unplugged, yep. with him sitting in that rocking chair. Yeah. Just there was. I don't know. There was something about it. I still love playing it to this day. It, it is one of those uh, time. It's a timeless album. Yeah. And I'm a huge fan as well. And, you know, once you start, once you put on the first track, which is nutshell for, for any Alice in Chains fans out there, you know, it's all over. You either have to, you know, change the album or it's going to bring a little tear to your eye. <laughs> I'm I'm probably going to listen to it on the way to work tomorrow, most likely, <laughs> now that we mention it. Yeah, yeah it that. was... Uh, so, so that one for me... And, so when, Anyway, my point in writing that was I had the thought um, after watching Jesse Lee Peterson, and he says all the time, you need to forgive your father, and mm -hmm. you need to forgive your mother especially. And I had done that without ever watching Jesse Lee Peterson. I came to that. I did it on my own. And funny enough, yes. I didn't know this at the time, but my mom also did it with her mom. And I'm thinking, nobody else is saying this enough. Nobody is explaining this, how we pay for what our fathers do. And so we have to forgive them to break free of them. So that's why I wrote that one. And then the, the emotion of... Lane Staley's life was my example afterwards. So for me, it was intellectual than emotional. It's funny how music can uh, stimulate memories and thoughts, concepts. Absolutely, absolutely. How do you how do you start writing, Jared? How do you let's just say. Uh, like, for instance, you know, we've all heard of the phrase of uh, a writer's retreat, going away, just getting out of your house, getting out of your normal environment, mm -hmm. going to a cabin, going to a camp, going to even a hotel room, just yeah. getting away from your normal environment and writing. What is, tell me about the value of the environment and its role in creativity and writing. Well, first of all, it's huge. It's huge. Um, I am a big proponent of no distractions. No distractions. So when I write, like when I'm sitting at my desk like this and I have to write something, there's no YouTube in the background. There's no background orchestral music to stimulate things. It's all distractions, everything. You know, the the... If something's happened, I have a window right over here. If there's something out, if something is happening outside my window, I shut the blinds and I turn on the light, even in the daytime. No distractions. Mm -hmm. And uh, the speaking of music, I know uh, my one of my favorite classical composers was Sergei Rachmaninoff, and I remember reading about him. And he was the exact same way. No distractions. When he he said he would he wrote that he would often work through meals, and his wife would just come in and peek her head through the door, and put a sandwich on the table by the door and leave. And there was no stopping. If he was in the if he was on a roll, don't distract him. You know that's what she learned. Of. 
And that's how I, that's how, that's what I feel about writing too. It's really hard to get more than one hour at a time of deep focused work uh, at once. But you can do a lot in that one hour. So if you figure, you know, you can write easily a thousand words in an hour. You sit down, there's no distractions, nothing. You've got, if you, you know, you don't get up for water, water's already there. And once you're in the mood, once you're on a roll, you're not going to want to get up to go to the bathroom. You're not going to want to get up to eat. You're going to finish it for that one hour. And if you could go a little farther, that's just fine. But you get that one hour in. And, you know, when you're right about that time and you're feeling it and you're feeling good, you can take a break. But don't stop in that time because you get that deep focused work in. You get on a roll and you you can accomplish a lot. But every dis, every and any distraction in that time, it keeps setting you back. So, you know, you can't have the email notification on. When you're, when you're when you're sitting at your computer and I some people do writing longhand there's a good and a bad to that the good is that it really slows your th- thoughts down and that's a good thing usually especially when you're on a roll the bad thing is that it slows your thoughts down so you can't get as much out so <laughs> yeah uh, you know it's funny I have uh, one one book that I've written that I wrote longhand, not on the laptop. Yeah. And now I've got to transcribe it, obviously, to bring it over to uh, the digital world. Mm -hmm. But there was something about having a clipboard in my hand and a yellow pad. And I was just sitting out here where I'm at right now and just literally filling up two to three full yellow pads, 100, 150 pages of longhand writing. And then, of course, I dread the transcribing part. <laughs> but there was something about it. And and even when I discovered the whole the joy of fountain pens, if you think that writing longhand with a normal pen slows you down, <laughs> writing with a fountain pen makes you get a little bit more artistic. You literally... You want to make it look good as well as sound good. So there is a, it really, really slows you down. And now and- I would say that writing is a lot like composing. When I think about, uh, I have one book about the lives of the, the great composers and they're authors, mm-hmm. right? Composers are authors. Well, one of those the good things about writing longhand, and I imagine even more so if you've got that fountain pen, is that it makes you kind of instinctively cut out all the extra stuff. So, you know, if you've got a sentence and you know what you want to set, you know what purpose you want the sentence to serve, you don't want to write the extra words. You want to get you want to get it out there so you could go on to the next one. What your hand is still writing, but your mind's going on to the next one. So you gotta you gotta make it happen, and that's one of the good things actually because it's oh George, let me tell you, I read a number of uh, uh, when I had Legends of Men, I wrote a lot about the sword and sorcery genre, Conan the Barbarian, for example, and I would get uh, some people, hey, can you review my book? And I would always try to accommodate because they're I want to promote the new authors but if there's one thing new authors do much worse than old authors is that they have just too many words and it takes away from the power of what you want to convey and bre- brevity is the soul of wit as uh, somebody once said I forget who yes but th- that's yeah. what you want to do and then You know, when I, uh, especially while I was in the military, I would carry a notebook with me everywhere. And there was a lot of hurry up and wait in the military, as I'm sure you know. So I would have to know. And if I had a great idea, I would just start writing longhand in my notebook, come back to my computer and transcribe it. And from taking it to the notebook to the computer is like one round of editing right there. 
So it's it's a uh, it's a good way to go about it. If if uh, and you know you can lean back in your on your comfy chair with your notepad. And, you know, so there's there's a lot of benefits to it. Are you? Let's talk about some of the technical stuff. Are you a sit at a desk and write, or a have a pad and a clipboard in your hand? Uh, what what is your tech? What am I observing? If I'm looking at you writing, what am I seeing? What is your situation like? Most commonly, I'm at a desk, just like I am right now. I will have, let's say, I'm writing. Um, a research essay, just for example, I have all, I've read all the research, I've highlighted portions that I want to include in my essay, I made notes about why I want it in there, how I can use it. Those are all up on different tabs, maybe in a PDF or something like that, right? And I have my document that I'm writing the essay in, and I pull up the research as I need it, and start writing and on my desk um i believe when you're in a cluttered area it's really hard to think it becomes hard to structure your thoughts especially in such a way that other people can understand it so my desk has got to be clean i'll have my water um generally don't have any food but i have water maybe hot tea and that's about it that's it. nothing to distract me. That's the most important part. The door is shut. There's no music. There's no podcast. There's no nothing. It's just me, my ideas, and any research if I want the research in. It's funny. I inherited a desk from my grandfather, and it is a classic writer's desk. A lot of people... Younger people don't know what this is. A lot of people ha will have a desk that they purchased and a, uh, trying to think, like either a gamer's chair or a, what's the popular comfortable chair that a lot of people have now? I'm, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of it. There's a certain chair uh, that a lot of writers use. But I remember when I inherited this writer's desk, I remember it growing up around this when i'd visit my grandparents there was this desk and there was a blotter on the desk remember blotters mm -hmm. and and there was nothing else there was like a little day and date calendar on the corner of the desk and i still have that for my grandparents but there was no distractions mm -hmm. at all nothing on the desk it was you sat down and each drawer had either envelopes or stationery in it and you didn't it wasn't a cluttered desk mm -hmm. there wasn't computers there wasn't anything there wasn't headphones it was a desk with a blotter on it and you opened up the drawer and you pulled out a pen mm -hmm. and you pulled out the stationery and you started writing and the whole concept of no distractions was so perfected back then and now with all the distractions, I'm glad you said that because so many people, like when you look at most people's desks, yeah. they're just cluttered. Yeah, they sure are. And, you know, I have things like pictures of myself and my wife and, uh, you know, like little statues that I've gotten here and there, but no bells and whistles, nothing, nothing moving, nothing to distract my senses, especially hearing is a big one for me because I don't quite understand people who have background music. As soon as there's music, I want to hear it. I want to know what's going on with it. It does, It's never yeah. in the background for me. So no music. And uh, I've made this mistake plenty of times of thinking like, oh, really interesting podcast. I want to hear it, but I got to send this email. No, I got to turn the podcast off when I'm writing the email, you know? So it's... Uh, you know, getting rid of the clutter is almost a, a just a really easy way of getting rid of the distractions. But it, clutter is all, you know, you're, you, you know, you walk into a messy room and you just don't feel, it's not, you don't feel the same as walking into a clean room, you know? And 
that affects how you think as well. Yeah, I know so many writers had uh, writer's retreats or a writer's cabin or something. I look, you know, when I look at like George Bernard Shaw, he wrote in a shed mm -hmm. that was on a giant swivel. I mean, it was a, literally like a garden shed that he could turn, literally, physically turn it so the sun would come in and illuminate the inside of the shed. <laughs> And, and that was pretty cool when I when I saw some pictures of that. But a lot of guys would get away. Uh, I know uh, Ernest Hemingway oh, yeah. had a had a stand up desk, and he did a lot of writing and typing while standing up. I thought that was interesting. Oh, yeah. Well, <clears throat> especially when you do it for a long time. You know, my desk at work has one of these that can switch between a stand up and a sit down. And I use it like that all the time because you, you got to, if you're doing something boring like going through a spreadsheet and you got to do a lot of it, it just becomes, you know, murder on your, on your joints and your, your circulation. You got to stand up and stretch and, you know, you got to go up and down. But generally speaking, I have those that, on this desk that I'm looking at you right now, but I don't actually use it that much when I want to write something. I want, because I sit down and I write. And like I said, I generally go for about an hour, um, give or take. And then I'll take a break. By that point, brain should be, you know, well worked like a like a gym exercise like a gym workout you know <laughs> like i worked it out for a good hour it needs to rest a little bit yeah i remember 20 years ago i used to write for a cigar catalog and i can't due to contractual reasons you know you get these cigar catalogs they're 50 to 70 pages and i used to write the kind of like the narrative about every cigar and in a catalog there might be a hundred different brands and you got to make each one sound like it's the answer to all your <laughs> life's problems and i used to be the writer for this particular cigar catalog that every if i said it everybody would know what it is and uh my best writing was done in the morning with two cups of coffee that was yeah. my that was my kind of like nootropic so to speak yes and but if i if i had three cups of coffee you know like like when you're in college you know you put on a pot of coffee and you drink a whole pot i can't even imagine drinking a pot of coffee anymore i just can't even i don't know i, I it, it would make me jittery but i found that when uh when I was typing and I was a hundred to 110 word per minute typist, I was a very, very fast typist. And at three cups of coffee, there would be more errors. Two cups of coffee, I was flying. It was great. And the words were flowing. My fingers were just using your word in the flow, just kind of like, Three cups of coffee, and that was my threshold. I couldn't do it. Do you use any nootropics at all, any caffeine or any anything to help you focus? Oh, first of all, absolutely. And uh, I love coffee, but much like you, uh, I can only drink so much. I like to drink it throughout the day. So what I do is I make it uh, weaker than most people generally like it. And so that way, if, when I drink it in the afternoon, it doesn't affect me as much. It's like I had two weak cups of coffee in the morning and another one in the afternoon. Whereas if most people drank two of their regular strong cups of coffee, it would make them feel to a certain way. For me, it doesn't make me jittery. It doesn't make me stay up at night. It dehydrates me. And that's the real problem. So co yeah. coffee is a must for me. Um, if you mix it with um, some original formula Sudafed, that's terrific. Modafinil is incredible if you 
from one is too strong, take a half of one. And I'll tell you what, that one hour can turn into four real quick. And uh, if you do a gym workout on modafinil too, you're going to get a good, good pump. Um, some you other ones. If, uh, oh, you go ahead. I, I was a uh, probably twenty to thirty years ago a Sudafed fan, and versus a Sudafed addict, because now mm -hmm. you have to you have to buy Sudafed at the front counter in most pharmacies right. now, and because people were making some kind of drugs out of it or something, I don't know. I, uh, I don't. Is that what it was? Yeah. And uh, it was magnificent. And it did not give you the jitters the same way caffeine did. No, not at all. And in fact, they go very well together. And uh, you can... Uh, choline, which is a mineral that most people are deficient in anyway, but there's also a, a class of... Um, nootropic supplement called racetams r-a-c-e-t-a-m and there's about five or six different types and you mix some of those which you can get on a on a good nootropic website you mix those with some choline great two to three hours of focus right there uh you could really mix any of these except for modafinil it's too strong yeah i don't recommend yeah that. But you can really mix any combination of these, and you will get some great focus. And I had those are all I have found to work for me. I did uh, Mike Cernovich's Gorilla Mindset. I tried that. It was a, more like a pre-workout for me than it was something to focus. It was much right. more like a pre-workout. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, and I, I do advocate if you've got a you've got a paper, you've got to sit down and write, you've got all these ideas in your head, you just want to get them out, I'm all for it. You, to, you know, use the aid because they work. And, you know, I don't, I don't recommend doing them two days in a row, oftentimes because I find that they dehydrate you. So yeah. you want to take the next day to just really hydrate. You want to do that anyway the same day, but you want to do it the next day too. So the two days in a row is just, too much i think yeah i remember zig ziglar talking about when you write he says write a page and a quarter a day and i don't know what the magic was in the page and a quarter but he would say a page and a quarter a day no matter what write a page and a quarter a day mm. and he was a, a sales guy and a, a sales trainer and that type of thing and motivational speaker and his work is phenomenal but that was his threshold he said he could do a page and a quarter a day and you know you do that every day for a year yeah. i mean think about think about how much volume there is there and that's probably why he said it page and a quarter i'm guessing that'll get you around oh well not around it'll give you over 400 pages and yeah you think if you did that every year if you wrote a page and a quarter every day and you edited, a, you know, two pages every day, you'd have a book every 18 months, you know? The, uh, but the, I've written fiction and nonfiction just because I uh, liked what I had in my brain, and uh, there was nothing like it. <clears throat> Once upon a time, I had these all of these uh, on sale at Amazon, I had to take it down, unfortunately. Amazon was doing this thing where if it sold if I sold a book in India for $2.99, when Amazon paid me, they did a wire charge. So they'd pay me two dollars and then my bank charged me twenty for the wire charge. And Crazy. Amazon would not work with me to get stop doing these wire charges. Yeah. And they only reimbursed me once, so I had to take everything down. Because, you know, I was getting, I'm like, sorry, sorry, Indians, but you can't, you can only buy so many here, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right, right. So I took it all down, but uh, I, I'm, I'm more of a fan of when you write something, you should 
try and make it have a little power. You should try and uh, have a message that you really want to convey. There are people who've, you know, made their living, made six figures even, writing books for Amazon Kindle, and they just crank these things out like one book every two months. And I'm, I'm I don't know. Jack London wrote a lot of books, but some were better than others and some were classics. And these people, they're writing like 50, 60 books and they're all yeah. throwaways, you know? Yeah. There's a guy that I'm going to have on, Russell Blake. He's a thriller writer. And I was, uh, Adele Ramsharan, who is one of my online mentors, who's written a lot. I asked her if she wanted to be on the show. She declined. She says, but I'm sitting here with Russell Blake in a cafe in Mexico, and he said he would love to be on your show. And I'm like, Russell Blake, who's that? And I looked him up. The guy writes, uh, he wrote something like one thriller a month for two years. Wow. And he's just an amazing writer. I mean, very similar to like Tom Clancy, like that kind of stuff. Okay. And uh, the guy is just a writing machine. And I'm thinking, how in the world does he do this? He sits in a cafe in Mexico overlooking the ocean. And he's in an inspirational environment. And he just flies through these books. And he's a, he's a bestseller. And he's ghostwritten a lot of books. And I forget how many books he's written. But with him, it was about the environment. And he would just create the perfect environment. And then, and then his the brain and fingers would do the rest. Yeah, the, the books would write themselves, so to speak. Do you find it easier, or I should say, no, I don't want to, that's a loaded question. What do you find easier, fiction or nonfiction? Oh, fi nonfiction, definitely, nonfiction. Because mm -hmm. I'm a believer that, uh, well, I don't want to say that like that, but. You can write fiction, and if you write a book, like uh, all these books you see behind me, these are almost all of them just men's adventure books. You know, they're they're fun. They're like a, a weekly hour-long TV show, action adventure. You read it, and it's like it's like a it's like a movie played out in your head, uh, very yeah. episodic. You know, they're fun. They're not meant for, but. When I write, when the fiction I wrote, I wanted it to have um, a little more weight. And I think one of the big problems with fiction nowadays is that people write books without understanding the impact that they want the book to have on the reader. And it's, you know, the, too many of the books are throwaway books, I think. Too many of them are just... Uh, you know, this was a fun read, you know, now I'm waiting for the next one. There's too many like that, you know, yeah. keep, it, keep it for the, keep it for the Russells, you know, let the, you know, let those yeah. guys do it. But the, I, I, you know, you think about all the, not all, but most of the great books you've, fiction books you've read that stick with you. And, you know, there was a point to it. And even if you didn't quite understand it, you just felt it and it was instinctual you know and there's some symbolism that's being expressed and through the plot and through the characters and you know by the end of it that you, you you're coming out a little bit better there's a there's a moral there and depending on the quality of the moral uh you know it's gonna be timeless um game of thrones very popular today. I am completely certain in 50 years it will be forgotten. But Lord of the Rings will be remembered for hundreds of years. And why is that? Because Lord of the Rings has a moral to it. Yeah. And by the end of it, you you come you come out of it with a feeling of how good can triumph over evil and things like that. Whereas Game of Thrones you're just kind of reading through a soap opera and it's a really high quality soap opera and it's medieval and there's dragons. So there's that to it, but in the end it's a throwaway book. And yeah, the, you know, that 
There's not enough Lord of the Rings and too many Game of Thrones nowadays. I had heard that there was something like 15,000 revisions of Lord of the Rings. There was a a stack. It was literally, he wrote 15,000 pages or something like that, I forget. <laughs> it was just ridiculous. He just kept writing and editing and writing and editing. And it start. he was, the story that I heard, he was, he was grading papers of his students at Oxford right. and got an idea in his head, took a piece of scrap paper and wrote on the piece of scrap paper in a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit and he pushed it over to the corner of his desk and then continued grading papers. And that was the beginning of all that we know is yeah. that whole series. So what's, uh, I know what you're talking about with uh, J.R.R. Tolkien and with that stat. One of the things he did, you know, he created the languages that was in that were in uh, Lord of the Rings. And one of the things he would do is he would write all these pages with a character name, and then he would say, "I want to hear how this sounds with with the character, but he has a different name." And so he would write the whole thing with the character with a different name. And then uh, I don't like either of them. I got to give him a third name. <laughs> so he was always doing things like that because he wanted it to sound. He wanted, if you read it aloud, he wanted it to sound a certain way. And, uh, you know, one of my favorite fiction author is Robert E. Howard. And he was a pulp fiction author. He created Conan the Barbarian and yeah. uh, a lot of other characters. And he, he writes with such a precision and somehow he writes with so much power in his prose that you can read this out loud and it sounds great and that's one of the it's very hard to do and you don't need to do it truth be told but if you can do it boy that's gonna it really sticks out and you know there are passages in lord of the rings that really stick out because it's got this elvish language that you it just sounds really pretty, if, you know, mixed in the prose. Yeah. One of my favorite, for lack of a better term, pulp fiction authors was H.P. Uh, Lovecraft, of course, in the yeah. horror genre, yeah. the father of modern horror, who started writing for a publication called Weird Tales. And Same I really like it. Yeah. So I, and I love that work. I love that work. And some people would say, well, that's really not, that's not real writing. Well, like you <laughs> said, you know, I hear how many years now it's over a hundred years that's beyond right. HP Lovecraft, you know, since he, since he started writing and we're still, we're still reading his work. And he still sells and just, uh, what was it? One or two years ago, there was the show on HBO called Lovecraft Country or something like that. And is it, yeah, he, he's a part of uh, he's our part of our lexicon now. You know, there's no getting rid of him. Yeah, but he, yeah. You know, he was a his the power of his prose really stuck out. And one of the great things about those they they wrote generally short stories. You know. And one of the great things about that is that it forces you to cut out all the extra stuff. You know, you've got a big story you want to tell in 10,000 words. How can you do it? And, you know, they, they did it. They, they painted a picture in your mind that was vivid and powerful. And they didn't have to describe the color of the leaves, you know, on the fifth day of autumn. And they didn't have to do all that. They knew exactly how to, exactly what to tell you to let your brain fill it in and and what to write to keep the plot moving forward to keep you engaged uh, Edgar, uh by the way uh i sent george also i wrote when i did legends of men i did a six part series of how to write masculine fiction and i compiled it all into a 22 page guide which i sent to george so Whenever you want to send that out for for any of the authors out there. Oh, that that sounds exciting. It does, and I I can't wait to do that. I know. Uh, how how do you define masculine fiction? How would you 
How would you define that? Um, masculine fiction is more about the. Uh, it's pretty. It, it's it's all the way deep in there. It's the quality of the, or not the quality. It is the character of the plot. I would say this: the most important thing about what separates masculine fiction from what we might consider feminine fiction is that in masculine fiction, the conflict is external to the main characters. In other words, in feminine fiction, most of the conflict is internal. It's people overcoming their inner demons to, you know, accomplish some goal. In masculine fiction, the conflict is external. It's your inner demons be damned. You've got to get the job done. And I personally think the most, this is most evident when you really don't even know the main character's thoughts. You just see how they act. And that's it. This is what I will say too. This is another difference between Game of Thrones and Lord of the Rings, which is a great example of it. In Lord of the Rings, you rarely know what's in the characters' heads. You know how they're feeling based on what they say, the dialogue, and what they do. In Game of Thrones, the entire book... I've read all five books. I won't do that again. When it, we read in the books, you spend the entire time in the characters' heads. And yeah. some lots of times you're thinking, what are, when are they going to do something? Like, yeah, you, you don't need to constantly cry over the character's backstory so that that is the main and most important difference and then how does the main character or characters you know defeat the bad guy accomplish the goal whatever they're trying to do and they have to use it using they have to do it using their masculine qualities and so one of the the things going through fiction in the past few decades especially is you know the story is of a a girl who didn't know she was special and then she finds out she's special and she's got all these <laughs> magic abilities and she kills yeah. the guy, you know, it's like, yeah. where did that come from? But yeah. With, with a, with a man, he starts the, he starts the story. He's not good enough. He has to grow in some way. And then by the end of the story, he's able to use his, you know, his, his muscles or his courage or his, you know, rapier wit or something like that. And then he beats the bad guy and he accomplishes the goal. And then that's the arc of the story. And there's a clear climax and a kind of a, a denouement, which is just a fancy word for resolution. And then it's over, you know? Yeah. I have heard, I remember learning in school about music. Music uh, can often go the same way, you know. You think of a, a Beethoven symphony, you know, it starts out, you introduce some ideas, you, you go through the road of trial, so to speak, which is a development, and you get to the high point, all the musical tension is built up, and it's there's the climax, and, you know, it's got a lot of power by that point. And then you, you it's a resolution, it's, you know, making you feel good about... Uh, is bringing those old ideas that were at the beginning of the piece and restating them and you know it's a nice closed loop ending you know well yeah. they I have heard it said that that is a masculine form of composing because it is like sex for a man and that you do you you do all this work you have the climax and then you kind of just you know you, you go to sleep uh, but there's closure, right? Yeah, <laughs> there's closure. And then, you know, after the climax, you take a nap. And then yeah. so for women, it's not like that. There may be multiple climaxes. There may be no climax. It may just be a steady state of something or, you know, hills and valleys, but there's no top of the mountain, so to speak. Or maybe there's multiple mountains, you know, and the, that structure, you can structure stories like that. I just don't think they're very clear in what they're trying to achieve if, if they are trying to achieve anything. And like I said, I think the best fiction tries to achieve some impression to the reader 
something they could take away. So also, all that combined means, you know, that there is something to what could be considered masculine fiction. As soon as you said masculine fiction and scenarios outside the man and not a guy just all caught up in his thoughts, instantly I thought of Jack London to build a fire. Instantly I thought of that. And which makes me now want to read it again. I'm going to pull that off the bookshelf. And I remember reading that when I was working at a psychiatric clinic. And I remember reading it in a group therapy session to build a fire. And it really inspired a lot of people who were dealing with mental mm -hmm. health issues. Jack London is great. Uh, probably one of the most underrated masculine writers of all time to build a fire white fang just out of this world just amazing writing very influential as well very mm -hmm. he was one of robert e howard's favorites yes i'm not i have not read a lot of jack london to be honest although i uh did go in when i lived in oakland i did go to the bar where he would sit at 13 years old and start writing because he, you know, he ran away early in life, and he would sit yeah. at the bar, and he was thirty. They let him work there. He was thirty. They let him sit there and write. I'm like this is cool. <laughs> that that reminds me of the Eagle and the Child pub outside of Oxford, where the Inklings would meet C.S. Lewis and Tolkien and his yeah. contemporaries, and. Uh, from what I understand, the tables that they would put together still have the ink stains from the dip pens that they used. And just for the heck of it, I would lo just love to go there and have a pint. Absolutely. I wonder which one left that ink stain there, you know? <laughs> it's a bit of history. And it's I remember. I like those types of things. C.S. Lewis said that you have to read the classics once every five years. And I think there's something to that because I think you pick something up every time you read a classic. I will tell you, I've read the Iliad twice. No, three times, three times. Mm -hmm. And I love the Iliad. And speaking of masculine fiction, I, I have come to believe if anyone is familiar with uh, Jack Donovan's The Way of Men, he says there are four tactical virtues that, you know, kind of define masculinity. They're strength, courage, masculine, strength, courage, mastery, and honor. And it took me a while, but I reread the Iliad after reading that. And I, I'm very convinced that the Iliad is like a fiction guide designed to impart the tactical virtues on any generation of men that read it because the entire story is just jam-packed with you know with exalting those virtues and then uh you know the guys who fail to be courageous those are the ones that get scolded so that when you combine what you combine one reading with another it really allows you to interpret things like that especially with how you know the Iliad is so many thousands of years old. Why would it last this long? Well, yeah. you can imagine that every generation who heard or read the story gets imparted with those values, and then they're the ones who win on the battlefield, you know, next time there's a war. Right. So there was that. And then there's uh, two Chinese classics. One is called uh, Romance of the Three Kingdoms. The other is called Outlaws of the Marsh. These are probably my two favorite books. They're huge. They're 2,000 pages each. And wow. I've read, I've read those three times each. I started reading Romance of the Three Kingdoms when I was like 15 or 16. And I just, I just loved the quality of the story. Again, the, the style of that Chinese writing you don't almost ever go into the character into the characters' heads. You you see what they do. You see what they say. You get some explanation of why, like from a a third person point of view. But you don't live in their head. You don't live in their feelings. And 
it's, it's that is, in my opinion that is so much better to read how does someone jared how does somebody start writing if they've never written before i have majority of adults watching this right now and will watch this in the future somebody is interested in writing but they're not formally trained they're afraid of maybe being judged formally trained is they're... really overrated <laughs> okay good uh, excellent all right so there's step one then just ignore that nonsense yeah <laughs> no it's it is good if you can um, learn some lessons from people who do it well, like what I'm trying to do right now. But, to, you know, depending on what you're trying to write, you don't need some formal education. Uh, let me give this little quote from the thing I sent you, which I call Jared's Guide to Writing Well. Very simple. The purpose of writing is to put an author's thoughts into a reader's mind. Now, depending on what you're trying to write, if you're trying to write a fiction book, just for example, let's say a novel, what are you trying to put into the reader's mind? And that's what, that's the, you know, so to speak, that's the moral of the story. It's what Edgar Allan Poe calls the impression. What do you want to impress upon the reader? Um, that being said, that was for fiction. For nonfiction, it's really, depending on the, what you're writing will determine the style, and you go from there. If you're writing a research paper, uh, the what you're trying to put, the thought that you're trying to put into the reader's mind will be your thesis statement. And depending on how big this paper is, it's either going to be the first sentence, the last sentence of the first paragraph, or in the last paragraph of the first chapter, you know, depending on how big it is. A style determines a lot for you, and you should let, don't break the mold, but, you know, follow that style and let, let it do that work for you so you can focus on the content rather than how to deliver it. If you, the tone of what you're writing, of what you want to do is also important. It's determined by what you're doing. If you if you have to do the company newsletter, you know, you want to write in a professional style. And so, you know, short, it's to the point. Um, you want to do some, you know, kind of faux humanistic statements like we're so great. We're so grateful to everyone for coming out to the fundraiser, you know, things like that. You know, you follow the conventions of a newsletter and then you let that kind of guide you how you would want how you would what specific messages you would want to put in if you're writing a blog you know you can get more creative you can start with a story if if you know if you've got your moral of the story you've got your thesis however you want to say it you're writing a blog you're writing a an email you could be as creative as you want to be so you know imagine George George sends out his emails, and he doesn't start with the first sentence. He starts with what he's drinking, you know. So you can you can you can be creative like that. You can start with a story, and then at the end, state very explicitly what you learned from it, and that's what you're trying to impress. And maybe you give some more examples why it's important things. You can be creative, you know. And the only the only thing with blogs and newsletters is that. You know, there's a there's a bit of a style that's grown out of that, especially for a lot of people. One sentence paragraphs, two sentence paragraphs. If you can't say it in that, if you you know, four sentence paragraphs are rarely seen in a newsletter you might get from someone you subscribe to. One to two sentence paragraphs, you know, short, straightforward, to the point. You know, condense it down. People want to read your email, but they don't want to spend twenty minutes on it. So. I say that's that's the that's the TLDR generation, right? Say again. That's the TLDR, yeah, uh, generation. <laughs> Too long, didn't read. Mm -hmm. uh, and I always love those comments where somebody would put TLDR semicolon. Uh huh. 
you already shortened it. They want the one sentence summary, you know? Yeah. Uh, I've, uh, a lot of people like uh, Nicholas Taleb, he's gone kind of out, out of fashion ever since the pandemic. But yeah. he used to have a lot of great things to say. And he said, if you could summarize a book, then you wouldn't need to read the book. You could just read the summary. Right. So that, that says a lot to shortening what you want to say. Now, you can always shorten anything to a thesis statement. But if you, you it's a, so it should be more than a thesis. It should have some supporting evidence to show why it's important, the significance of it why you are right, why opposing ideas are wrong, things like that. And I say just start with the style, define the style, because that is going to guide you into what actual words you're going to want to put down. If you know you have to write uh, something that sounds professional, you know you're not going to put too many of your own personal feelings in there because it's going right. to a professional audience. So you're going to keep it, you know, as technical as possible, as impersonal as possible, I should say. I remember, um, well, of course, in the 70s, when you were asked to read a book in English class, there were many people who would go and get the cliff notes. And I don't even know if there's cliff notes anymore, but people will say something, well, I didn't read, I don't know, I didn't read the rational mail. What's the, give me the cliff notes <laughs> version of it, and you know, or whatever. And that has almost become like a slogan. Just give me the Cliff Notes version mm -hmm. of it because I don't want to read the long form anymore. Yeah, it sure has. And that's a, that's a shame. It's, in a fiction book, the entire thing, how, how the story is presented can be as important as the story itself. So a Cliff Notes for that just doesn't work. And I remember I had to read this book when I was getting a master's degree, and it was about why the li how the lives of the top 20% of money makers differ from the bottom 80%, and you know how they're able to get get the break, catch the breaks, and stuff like that. If you had a cliff note to this, you would read it, but you wouldn't be able to critique it you wouldn't be able to analyze this book in reading the whole thing i was able to analyze it and i said you know the problem with this book is that it gives a host of descriptive statistics one after another and these are disjointed and they're like they they don't work together the studies don't work together the statistics don't work together the author is not painting a picture of how the lives of these top 20% look compared to anyone else. I said by the end of this for the course, I said, I don't know what I'm supposed to take away because I've been bombarded with statistics, but no meaning. You couldn't get something like that off the cliff notes. Yeah. I, I remember... I always read long form. I was a huge fan in high school. I was a huge fan of John Steinbeck of mice and men, grapes of wrath. Yeah. And I, I couldn't get enough of that stuff. And there was no cliff notes in the world that could describe the grapes of wrath or of mice and men. You just, you couldn't condense it in such a way. It wasn't, it was not meaningful. You couldn't speak about it intelligently. Yeah, how are you supposed? <laughs> how are you supposed to put in? Like, you know, imagine a cliff notes for of mice and men, and you're like, you're very worried about Lenny when uh, he breaks the rabbit's neck, or you, you know, <laughs> how could you put that in there? You know, yeah, you, you can't convey the significance of it without reading the whole thing. You know, you know, it's interesting how a first sentence, like I talked about. Tolkien's uh, in a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit mm -hmm. and that really really set the trajectory just just hearing that sentence does something to me when I hear that yeah. it just in the same way when uh, I, I've become uh, a friendly acquaintance with 
Gerald Charles Dickens, the great, great grandson of Charles Dickens. He and I know each other and he comes to this area and performs uh, his great, great grandfather's works in a one man show, which is just, it just never gets old. It just never gets old. But when I think of Charles Dickens, uh, well, first of all, when I see Gerald, you know, I shake his hand. I'm like, I'm shaking the hands of a Dickens. Yeah. This is, <laughs> this is, I mean, it's just, it's like, mm -hmm. it's goosebumpy crap. I mean, it's yeah. just, it's crazy. It's, it's just crazy. But uh, when I think of Dickens, I think of it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Yeah. Of course, the beginning of Great Expectations. Holy cow, that set mm -hmm. the trajectory for the entire story. Without that sentence, I don't think Great Expectations would be Great Expectations. I don't think so either. And do you know, did he write that sentence first? Because I could really easily see him finishing almost the whole book. And then you know, going back to the beginning and kind of putting that right in there and setting the tone for the whole thing, knowing of what was going to come later, you know? What a great question. I'll probably, probably have to look up a, see if I can find a bio of Charles Dickens or even ask Gerald himself uh, and see what he knows about that. If for people writing nonfiction books too, if you want to write a nonfiction book, one of the best things you could do is do the introduction last. So, for example, uh, I've done this as well, uh, but a, a better example might be that people might know might be Mike Cernovich when he wrote Guerrilla Mindset. He wrote all the chapters on mindset, and then he went at, at the end is when he wrote the introduction. And the introduction has those kinds of personal stories of, like, you know, how you struggle with mindset. And, it, you know, you, he learned to overcome what he learned to overcome, how he learned to overcome it, why it was so important, how it changed his life, and then what it's going to do for you. And he wrote that stuff last. And that, that is the most, you know, personal stuff. And... Uh, lots of times with nonfiction like that, that's exactly what you get. So, you know, if you are, for example, if you want to, I'm just picking this off the top of my head. If you want to write a how to collect Hot Wheels, vintage Hot Wheels, you know, you start with the, the more technical aspects of the book, you go through, and then you write the introductory chapter last, and it's going to have the kind of, you know, compelling message of you know how you fell in love with hot wheels as a child and you know your grandpa on his dying deathbed gave you a hot wheel and you've always loved or, you know something like that but yeah that's that's when you go to the to the last part yeah i think i well i got the audiobook gorilla mindset and it, it's amazing how um some of our experiences have kind of cross paths even before we knew each other uh, the victor prides the mike cernoviches and such and and i'm a huge fan of just reading to people and i've i've been known to just come online at night and just read to my audience yeah and my my i always say just read to the people that you love that's my thing just read to the people that you love and uh i would read some victor pride i would read some mike cernovich uh, and, but I listened to Gorilla Mindset maybe three or four times during a commute to work. And it would take me about seven days to get through it, listening to it. Yeah. And I thought it was incredible. It's very great practical advice uh, on mindset. And, you know, it's the type of book where you can completely skip the chapters that don't apply to you or don't apply to you right now and you only read the stuff that applies to you and it's it's still a great resource you know i, I, I highly recommend it and i always have ever since i read it yeah yeah it's good stuff and then of course when when i when i actually met mike i was uh 
recalling some things to him that he wrote and I, his attitude was i wrote that <laughs> it was kind of funny <laughs> uh but he he was he was a pleasure uh to meet and spend some time with and i i've uh, interviewed him a couple times and had some uh good private conversations with him and and uh i you know he was controversial he knows how to stir controversy and yeah. such much less nowadays i mean probably four or five years ago he was he was much more controversial i think uh being a parent kind of calmed some of that stuff down i just that's exactly I what i was gonna say he has three kids now does he really yeah oh wow that's something that is something yeah they're all they're all so, next to each other and they're all pretty they're all pretty young so i i agree with you i think uh the I know it was this way for me, but the threat of being canceled, it makes you kind of, not kind of, it makes you definitely consider if you want to be an edgelord, if you want to be a, a troll just for the fun of it, you know, if you want to stir people up just because you know you can, you know. Yeah, I just, last night, I got an email from uh, the Dr. Phil show. They want me to, they'll fly me into Los Angeles uh, for a show next Tuesday. And I would have taken them up on it five years ago. Now I just avoid controversy. I'm just not interested in any, I mean, cancel culture is pretty strong right now. And, uh, I like my life the way it is right now. And I don't, you know, I have a nice life and I don't want to keep it that way. That's what I keep and saying. Enough historical evidence to know what this is going to be. It's going to be, like when Matt Walsh went in and there, you know, he was surrounded by three trans people and he's the only yeah. one there going, how can you be trans? You can't define a woman. Or yeah. It's going to be like Roosh V with Dr. Oz. Har like, oh, that was, that was painful to watch. Painful. For those who don't know, Roosh V wrote a very controversial article about fat women. And so they invited him on to speak about it. And they brought him on, and Dr. Oz starts attacking him verbally. Like, how can you say this? And just so you know, here's the front row full of fat women to yell at you for the next 10 minutes. And that's yeah. exactly what happened. And he, he could barely get a word in edgewise. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, was, that was painful to watch. It really was. And, and knowing him now, how he has kind of dialed it all back for many different reasons uh it it's been it's been interesting watching that definitely well, that's what was that's what would have happened to you is, yeah. you know you would have been there and dr phil would have asked you well what about this and that and you'd have a yeah very good sanity clarity reason and then you know here comes one person who's insane unclear and unreasonable <laughs> yeah <laughs> <You know>? exactly <laughs> exactly that's crazy well, will you come back again and we'll talk more about this? And I have to go through uh, the writer's guide and I am going to uh, publish that on Patreon as well. Uh, come back and we'll, we'll talk about it. And uh, we do have some writers in my audience. Uh, and there are people here that always love when you come on. So uh, I'd love to bring you back again and talk about this and our conversations always go long and and deep and uh so definitely want to have you back well i love being here and i will just let me uh plug this for you because when george puts my writing guide on the patreon it's it's valuable for anyone including if you're just a, a regular professional you need to write emails if you need to do any sort of nonfiction writing you know you need to to write a grant is this will be beneficial to anyone of any capacity you think about starting a blog it's gonna it's gonna be helpful to you so go join george's patreon like i do great thanks jared and you know coming from someone who's written hundreds and hundreds of entries and written books before and uh on a wide variety of topics fiction and nonfiction. 
you are someone to listen to. You know how to put pen to paper. You know how to. Uh, that's why I asked you. You know, what is your situation like? How do you how do you situate your desk and what is your environment like? And and that's all super important. Super important when starting writing. A lot of people will try to write in their kitchen, you know, while the kids are screaming and playing or music's going on or the TV's on in the next room and all this stuff. And uh, there is an art to creating the perfect vibe and the scenario or your own little writer's retreat, you know, to get. And also, too, I have never heard anyone else other than actually Cernovich. uh, He and I had this talk about the nootropics as well. So thank you for bringing that up. And that, and I know that's news to a lot of people. Some people are like, what? And I think we're going to set, uh, I think a lot of people are going to go off on a little research journey to yes, follow yes. through on some of the things we talked about, but, uh, truly, uh, in, in the same way that like everyone gets up in the morning, has their coffee or their tea mm-hmm. or whatever, it works. Yeah, it works. Know what works. And use it wisely, you know. Don't uh, th- these are these are there for you to use, and they're safe. And uh, you know, I, I told you the biggest problems with them already: getting dehydrated. You know, don't take them two days in a row. You're gonna you're gonna dry yourself out. You know, it's really not that. It, pe- people act like you know it's the same as doing steroids when you want to get in shape well no it's not it's not a steroid cycle but guess what even if it were i'm okay with you using steroids too you know learn how to do it and do it well you don't have to but it can be an aid and uh, with the nootropics it's definitely an aid especially if you you've you've got a lot on your mind you want to you want to go four hours a day you've got the time you've got the time throughout your you know now your schedule's clear i've got so many hours a day to write i just can't push it out take some day new tropics and get it out you know <laughs> yeah well it, it just reminds me of um many uh singer songwriters that would kind of chemically alter their their brains mm-hmm. and write uh-huh. some of the most incredible music and i remember uh someone called uh like Hendrix and Pink Floyd, they said that's druggy music, and I would say, yeah, it is. Like, like I, I wasn't like defending them. I'm like, yeah, you're right, you're right. Purple Haze is still great, you know. <laughs> it, it's exactly. I mean, Dark Side of the Moon. I mean, there, no one in their right mind could write that beautiful symphony, Dark Side of the Moon. It was just, just beautiful. Yeah, and then I, I just say it like this, just. Educate yourself a bit, you know, experiment wisely, use it well. Uh, one band that I don't like who is, you know, druggy music is Fish. I find them unlistenable. But Yeah, yeah. Uh, never, a never a Fish fan, it's ever. The spectrum from Fish to Jimi Hendrix, though, is what I'm saying. Right, <laughs> right, exactly. Well, Jared, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we'll do it again sometime, and uh, I appreciate you, man. I do. Well, thank you. And I appreciate uh, being on and I'm always humbled and uh, uh, it feels good. The audience enjoys it. So it makes me feel good too. So thank you all. Excellent. Thank you, Jared. Good night now. Good night.